as technologies like 3D modeling, CAD design and additive manufacturing are becoming more and more common and the cost is coming down, these techniques or technologies can be incorporated into more and more builds and this helps streamline the build process making sure that when everything goes together it does in fact fit and work exactly as intended. We're here at BBI Autosport with Dimitri who is responsible for this side of BBI Autosport's business. Now, for a start Dimitri, let's go back a little bit. How did you actually learn the skills of 3D modeling? Because I know this is a bit of a pain point for a lot of enthusiasts. They know the technology is there, they know what it's capable of, but it just seems like a really insurmountable task to new learn something new like that. Um, I don't think it's out of reach per se. It's uh, very much like a seat time thing. For me, it was just trial by fire, get thrown into the environment and, you know, start learning about CNC machines, learning about programming, learning about design, and then just picking up random things off the shop floor and designing them in the spare time and getting used to the concept of CAD design. And then going from there, YouTube, and uh, learning from other people who've been doing it for a while and just sort of absorbing that. Um, I think what you said is exactly correct. It, it, it's not difficult, but I mean, it's a perceived sort of complexity of getting involved. I think the other thing is people tend to watch some of the more professional uh, high-end 3D modelers that are on Instagram or Facebook and sort of see what they're producing and think, well, I can never do something like that. Of course, the reality is you, you don't need to be working at that level, do you? I mean, even just making up uh, designs for brackets, mounts, that's really helpful and not too difficult. No, I think it's uh, like knowing what you're trying to do is important. And so, um, you know, if you are just making a bracket, if you want to do a 2D piece, even just less for water jet, just draw it up in Fusion 360 and then, you know, make the DXF file, send it to send, cut, send, and then you get a piece back, you know, and maybe, or, you know, if time is short, then you can either print a one-to-one -one thing on a piece of paper on a printer and then just overlay it over the aluminum or steel and cut it out on the bandsaw or something like the or you can go 3d print something at a titanium like the, the range is based on whatever your current need is and and skill level so if you don't want to learn all that then use it to what you can benefit from you know if you do and then you continue on progressing then sky's the limit really yeah I, i'd come back and just talk about a few of those terms you, you just mentioned there and I think one of the elements is that there's an unlimited range of things we can do with software like Fusion 360, but I think one of the areas that's really, really useful is the sheet metal working tool set that allows you to design a bracket, maybe fold up a bracket and then flatten it out, print it out as you mentioned on a piece of paper. You also mentioned using uh, Send Cut Send, which is a third party company. How do you work with a company like Send Cut Send? So, I mean, they provide laser cutting services for, I don't know, it seems like a really large <laughs> array of materials. So um, for somebody like us, you know, if we're trying to make uh, some bracketry for a cage or for, I don't know, some engine components, you know, it's easy to just drop up in CAD, uh, send them a flat pattern or just a 2D file. And then, you know, maybe a week and a half to two weeks later, you get a array of parts. It could, it could be like 100 pieces, you know, if it's a bunch of little things to mount a bunch of brake lines or... I don't know, it could be three pieces for mounting fuel rails or something. So we don't have a laser cutter. They do. And uh, I mean, if you buy a little bit of time or you plan your project accordingly, that's a really nice way of getting parts without having to get dirty in the shop or, you know, and create really nice pieces in a reasonable amount of time, I think. Uh, the time element, I think, is, is something that's just worth focusing on a little bit. I, I'm, I'm guilty of this myself as are a lot of enthusiasts where we want to knuckle down and just do everything ourselves and, and that goes for making these little tabs or brackets you know yes we can print out the the template mm -hmm. cut the part ourselves out of a piece of alloy or steel or whatever it may be but it's really important as well particularly if you are doing it for a, for a living to focus on the amount of time that takes but it's, it's easy to overlook that and not kind of put a value on your time but particularly as a business time is money correct? Time is absolutely money. And I think that's the most elusive thing, especially in the day to day. You get easily lost in what you're spending your time on, how you're spending your time on. And you get blinded by like the instant gratification of spending a couple of hours whittling out a bracket versus like, what could you have been doing instead? Um, I have this conversation with many people, especially like the older school fabricators who are are not in tune with the digital design aspects. So I'm like, you know, you could either spend 
uh, have a, a mock-up chassis on a fixture table and you could physically be positioning a, a, a race seat within that. Like, how does it go here? What is it interfering with? Versus we could iterate that pretty quickly in CAD and then just do a really rough layout. We're not determining the tube layout or the seat position, but you can actually just see where things are relative to the scan data, relative to the chassis, relative to the table, and then shortcut your way forward further, right? And that means uh, less cutting on the, you know, and in, in, in person, less like fabricating and then less mistakes. But then, you know, so that's also like a time management balance, right? It's balancing your resources, balancing your time. And if you can plan and schedule accordingly, and that is by all means a luxury for everybody, um, and then it could be, you know, six months or five days. Uh, if you can budget time, uh, it's just a really powerful thing to be able to then leverage resources that somebody else has built up, like Site Consent or anybody with a CNC machine shop, that you can send them things that they're really good at, and then you get really good parts back, you know? The other element that goes along with this, maybe it goes without saying, but I'll mention it. I mean, obviously, all of the equipment that you would need to make, the, the range of parts you can design in, in Fusion 360, is expensive. I mean, most enthusiasts, I mean, most shops are not going to have a five axis CNC or maybe a, a laser cutter or a water jet cutter. So, you know, for essentially cents on the dollar, you can use a company like Send Cut Send, get that part back, and it's as good as, as it would be if you had all of that equipment in house. But, like I say, cents on the dollar. Now, I just want to come back to your involvement uh, and how you've used some of these technologies on obviously one of the, the more well-known cars to come out in 2022, which is the, uh, the Hoonapig, Hoonapig Assist. Uh, this was a really complex job, as I understand it, between uh, Joe Scarbo and BBI Autosport. I'm interested in finding out how you worked in with Scarbo in terms of he was doing the chassis design, you were responsible for basically all of the engine systems, and to me that sounds like it could either work really, really well or it could be a, a complete train wreck if, if you guys aren't speaking the same language and doing things at, at the right time. So tell us how you work uh, in a complex task like that. So that the Huna Pegasus was very much a uh, takes a village project where we had us doing the sort of the project management, charge of the powertrain. Joe Scarver was doing the chassis development, all the suspension setup. We had the oil stain lab guys shaping the car visually, and we had Virus Engineering kind of shaping it closer to reality and then doing the CFD trials on it. So all also in a very, very tight time frame. All and within just I mean pretty much a month and a half to two months before we had to really conquer down and start freezing things, you know? Um, so the challenge there was to get everybody talking on the same kind of coordinate system, if you will. Uh, you know, the, the Vera's guys operate in Siemens, uh, Joe works in SolidWorks, I work in Fusion 360, and then the oil stain guys are in alias. So we're all using multiple platforms and us, BBI being the project managers, we sort of established, okay, here's the origin point that everybody operates on, kind of the, the golden center for anybody working on the project. Joe issued a kind of a, a, a bare bones chassis layout that everybody else can pile on top that I could place an engine and driveline within that Joe already kind of did as well. The oil stain guys can work with shaping the fenders and kind of getting the visual of it. And the viewers guys can start piling on all the aero details and building the floor and diffuser. And then at some point it kind of morphs into this thing, you know. Um, the collaboration is hectic within everybody because sometimes we'll place an object, but then it punches through a fender liner. Sometimes the fender liner would, you know, interfere with the wheel travel. And it's just sort of this... Uh, five-way tug of war between everybody, you know, but at the end, we have a very concrete goal and every, pretty much we had like almost daily meetings about like, what is it that we need to achieve in the immediate? What is the, has the longest lead time? And that was the driver for everything because of the short timelines. And so that tug of war ends up being kind of turning chaos into a little bit of a controlled chaos where like we have a plan, we have an agenda, we have a bit of a schedule and then the rest is kind of dictated by time and the opportunity. And so we we're always balancing like how much is Joe spending in the chassis design and doing all the details and how much are we going to take over here just building it in, you know, when we have the thing on hand, you know, and making our own brackets. So maybe Joe won't do, be doing the small nitty gritty brackets. We would do that in house, but that releases the chassis from him sooner, which then allows us to get to other things quicker and so on and so forth. So uh, there's no perfect way of doing that for something like that with a tight timeline. But um, in, in hindsight, if we had, 
we could choose something. I wouldn't expand the team. I would expand the timeline a little bit because then we could take care of the details. Uh, unfortunately, that sort of comes back to that time is money. And, and unfortunately, we can't buy more time when you've got a deadline for a launch of a car. It, it sort of is what it is and drives the rest of it. I'm, I'm interested with the four separate entities working in four different software packages, does that create any sort of potential errors or uh, it's, it's not actually a big deal? No, I think um, everybody kind of plays along nicely. We've established a transfer format early on that everybody is operating in like step files or IGES files. And then, and then as long as everybody doesn't, nobody screws up the origin point, everything kind of lands well into the CAD software. So we don't have any problems with that. I don't think we've had any, had any like lost in translation errors between the platforms. I was aggregating everything in Fusion because it is a very powerful thing to bring everything together. And we were ultimately the guys who saw the big picture. Um, but at any given point, there was just all sorts of exchange happening. But um, I think for such a project, the biggest thing is establishing like a good order of uh, like project management um, procedures. And then who's, the, who's responsible for what, having ownership for each aspect, and then also have a checks and balances that somebody is always like the guy or the, the group that's like yay or nay on decision making. Otherwise, everybody's always wanting to pull their own direction and then like we have to bring it back together you know i'm interested to know sort of in terms of the actual overall design obviously you've got the mission critical components such as where the engine and the the gearbox are going to go you've got the drive shaft that runs through the center of the car that's a given and then you've got the uh, suspension design the kinematics of that to get the suspension doing what you want then is there any sort of kind of consideration given during the design stage for, oh, we could do this in three different ways. This is the way that's going to actually make the car easier to to work on because I see that so often as, as overlooked. You get this beautiful design, uh, on paper it works well, probably performs really well on the racetrack as well, but then the day-to-day -day servicing work that needs to be done, maybe uh, you know the gearbox needs to come out, the engine needs to come out, and that gets really, really hard. So can you t talk to us a little bit about what went in there, if anything? Yeah, I think... It goes back to the time thing. The longer you spend on the project, then you can start noodling on the details of like, hey, how do we handle extraction? How do we handle this assembly? Um, again, that was a luxury. And uh, luckily the whole car is pretty modular, but um, it's just knowing your constraints and trying to like get ahead of that. And so like if we had known the engine package better earlier on, then maybe that would have opened up a little more sensibility for servicing the car. Um, but you know, in our guys' defense, now we can rip the thing apart in half a day and put it back together within within a day. So, so you, you learn really learn how to work around those here. constraints that are built into the car, anyway. For sure, we've we've definitely worked around that, and we know it's been modified here and there to accommodate the ease of it. And it's just understanding, like, hey, this comes together this way, but it doesn't come together that way, and it's kind of works just the same. So then it's also a matter of like, we're working within a time constraint that was an immovable thing right so then i feel like we did as best as we possibly could have given the scale and the caliber of project to deliver the kind of thing that we ended up delivering i, I kind of see that there's there's two ways you can look at that there's the potential changes you could have made to maybe make the thing a little easier to work on but at the same time having that enforced time frame means that you have to avoid analysis paralysis you can't sit there for two weeks thinking about where to locate a particular component you just don't have that luxury decisions need to be made to keep things moving uh, i want to move on and talk about some of the the techniques or construction techniques manufacturing techniques that sort of go hand in hand with 3d modeling and of course there's you know physical cnc machining of, of a block of billet alloy for an, one example and then there's additive manufacturing as well and i know that you have embraced that technology quite heavily so you know, what's the future hold? What are the abilities of this now? Is 3D printing of metals, you know, alloy, and canal, titanium, is that within reach price-wise for the average enthusiast or is it still super expensive? Is, is it the way? Yeah, what's your thoughts on that? I think um, it's getting there, right? Just like five access parts were, you know, within, starting to become within reach at a certain point a couple of years ago. Now 3D printing is replacing a lot of the, or enabling people like us to build things that we would not have op, opted to do, maybe uh, to some degree, but it's definitely coming in, it's definitely trickling down from the aerospace guys, and then we're, you know, machines are 
people, more printing places have machines that do metal and they're getting hang of it. So it's definitely there. I think that uh, your average enthusiast, maybe with Porsches, can cr get a product that has AM in it. Uh, maybe your average enthusiast in BMWs and Hondas may not because the price points are lower. So, um, but just like with any industry, any time, you know, like the higher value clientele will get the higher value technology and then it'll make its way down to, you know, the more broader application. But for motorsport, it's pretty priceless because things that you would normally be, you know, have to cast or figure out how to do like rapid investment casting or something which uses printing in the, in the first place, you know, just printing a direct part, of, part in metal, it's like, it's just such a shortcut, you know, and it makes it easy. It opens up a lot of uh, opportunities and solves a lot of problems. Now, a lot of people thinking, looking at uh, 3D printed metal components w would assume that there is some downside in terms of strength, density, reliability compared to manufacturing in a more traditional sense. Is, is there any truth to that? No, you just can't forget that printing yields pretty much equivalent of a really, really nice cast part. So any critical tolerances will still need to be machined. So that doesn't alleviate you from like O-ring seals and threading and things like that. But um, to get large bodies of parts or complex geometries or things that incorporate a lot of different elements into one part that, you know, if you still accommodate the machining part, like it, that can resolve problems. But you can't, uh, you can't think that, oh, can I convert one part into printing and one part from printing to machining? Like you have to start designing something knowing that you're going to print it or knowing that you can machine it. So knowing the process is still very much important. Printing is not a replacement for a current process. It's a new process. So every time you design or endeavor onto, you know, with a project, then you have to know that, hey, I'm going to be printing this. So how can I leverage this to my advantage? How can I squeeze more out of it? Because it is more expensive, but you know, in a printed part, you can compile five parts where you may be machining those five parts before, you know? And so kind of have to weigh the, the trade-offs, you know, but it doesn't solve everything, but it solves a lot, you know, in terms of accessibility and simplicity and enabling you to create. In terms of getting a component uh, 3D printed in metal, uh, I assume it's very similar to the likes of Sencart Send. There's companies out there specialized in doing, doing this for uh, individuals. Yeah, it's not quite as automated, I think, that because uh, 3D printing a component still requires a little bit of a human aspect where, you know, you have to position the part, they have to run simulation on it. There's a lot of forces and kind of properties at play that they need to validate because a failed print is still a very expensive failed print, so they'd rather not. Most of these print shops won't do that, you know. So the turnaround time for coding is a little longer, but it's pretty much as easy, you know. It's as easy as sending something to your local machine shop. Handle it, code it ship you the part you know I, I just want to learn a little bit more about some of the design com considerations that go into something like an inlet manifold a plenum chamber and, and I've seen various uh, sort of iterations around the BBI Autosport workshop uh, particularly one that caught my eye you've got a manifold designed with uh, injectors that are positioned above the inlet trumpets which is quite unique and it's a sort of a, a double plenum style design so how do you go about validating before something's made that that's actually going to be a step forward or is it just coming from experience using any CFD analysis or is it just from experience and what what sort of looks right to your eye? Yeah, it's going to be a balance, again, based on time and budget. Uh, a lot of, some of it is rule of thumb kind of things that will work. It's a boosted car. There's not too much, you know, fine tuning to do. Um, for projects like the Pikes Peak stuff, we will run CFD analysis, make sure that things are working the way they need to, that they're hitting the flow parameters. Um, and that's changing too. Like, for example, on the Pikes Peak car, the headers and some of the intake uh, manifold designs were designed with generative flow. So it's computer generated uh, geometry to help optimize the flow paths of headers and, and intake uh, gases. So, so is that sort of generative design, but for flow? It's Yeah, it's built into fusion. Um, and it's the next kind of stage of generative design where you're selecting from and to locations like, uh, you know, exhaust port to collector and then you're saying here are the obstacles and here is the parameters of the gas flowing which would be like combusted methanol under boost right and then the temperature the gas properties and then it maps out a tube based on those parameters for and targeting minimal pressure drop so i would use that as a target reference okay you tell me where i'm going how i'm doing it and i'll model over it and there's my tube so like things like that 
we're starting to infuse into our products and our concepts and it's just a shortening the time and b cutting out some of the guesswork so when you're the validation on the back side may be a lot quicker because we've already done the validation on the front side when we're specifying the parameters and it's defined the computer already generated that based on those parameters the first so time. theoretically it should work out and the validation should be and it does. spot on yeah it does we've we've done some of the testing and the pike speak stuff and it like i mean you, just just as you're asking me it's like i was skeptical i was like eh, there's no way and then it kind of works and i'm like Cool, I guess the computer's no better, you know. Hey, and what we see with generative design in, in mechanical components, not necessarily header tubes, for mm -hmm. example, is that the designs we see are very organic and really can only be, be manufactured using additive manufacturing. Is that the same with these header designs? Would we be able to conventionally fabricate them or are the designs quite intricate that really lend themselves nicely to additive manufacturing? I think that a little bit is a common misconception because you can shape generative. Generative you can either take as generated, which I don't think is quite there yet. Uh, generative should be a guiding point, right? So even with generative structure stuff, you can take the load pass and how it's generating this organic shape. You can convert it and like in Fusion 360, you can define the manufacturing process, for example. You can say it's going to be like three axis machined with this orientation and it'll shape it based on those constraints. To be something that can actually be manufactured. Yeah, and a three axis, right? Or a five axis or printed. And then I would even go one step further and say, constrain those parameters and then work over that. You know, you don't have to follow the path exactly. You can shape it based on what you know from understanding manufacturing processes or something like that. Generative design could also be converted to like things like sheet metal. So, I mean, a load path is also like a rib that's laser cut. You know, you could piecemeal it together in crazy ways. Same thing with generative flow. You could take what was generated, use that as a reference, you, you know, and if the tube is this weird pancake shape, shaping, you know, squeezing through constraints, well, if you want to snake it around a little differently, you know, like you can, if, as long as you're willing to deviate from that a little bit and be smarter, and understanding your end goal. If your end goal is to create something quicker using readily available off-the-shelf components, then by all means, leverage that, right? You don't have to print it. How important is it for those getting started with uh, the likes of Fusion 360 and they want to actually have components manufactured and maybe we're talking here about CNC machining as opposed to uh, additive manufacturing. How important is it to have a, a good understanding of what's going to happen in order to take that 3D model and turn it into a physical component in terms of the machining processes, how that machine works so that you don't sort of get yourself into a position where you've got a product that looks great but is either impossible or incredibly expensive to manufacture compared to one that had been thought out and designed with manufacturing in mind? I think that question is driven by understanding the end goal. Are you trying to create something that's like pushing the limits of what a function and creativity and is it going to be a one-off then don't constrain yourself with manufacturing processes push the envelope right use all the tools available if you're trying to create I don't know, a, uh, like a, a fork for a motorcycle or a bicycle, then you need to create, you're planning to sell 500 of these things. Then you have to be cognizant of the limitations of machining. Like, is it gonna be a five axis part, three axis part? What are the ins and outs? What are the nuances? Then, then that knowledge of process has to really kick in. I guess that's what differentiates like a mechanical engineer and then a manufacturing engineer where the manufacturing engineer will force the mechanical engineer and be like, no, we can't make this. This is how you design it. And then the CNC operator says, clean the slate, we'll, we'll do it. We're gonna do it completely different. But yeah, like process and goal, they're all like intertwined. And then I'm just, but uh, in my experience and not coming from like a conventional engineering background, like it's, there's a, there's a benefit to being unconstrained by process because it opens up possibilities, but then also understanding the process creates a, a feasible, repeatable, sustainable product that it can sustain a business, you know? So that's, <laughs> there are a lot of variables, you know, understanding them is crucial. Okay, yeah, I just wanna sort of talk about what a enthusiast would need to understand in terms of the engineering element. I, mm -hmm. I haven't talked about your background, whether you've gone through a mechanical engineering degree or anything of that nature. Is that your background? No, my background is economics. But. Okay, per perfect, because it's a good indication that you don't need to have gone to university. But where I'm going with this is you know, we're potentially des designing and making some components that could be really mission critical. You know, if a suspension component fails, that's probably going to end badly. A and in turn, that, that requires some understanding of the forces involved, mm -hmm. the strength of the materials. 
which goes a little bit beyond the knowledge of most enthusiasts. Are, are there any tips you could give those watching who want to get into this, this sort of design to make sure that they're designing parts that are safe? Should they be consulting with a mechanical engineer? Should they be consulting with uh, those that are going to make the parts? Yeah, what, what, what would your advice be? Obviously, if you're an enthusiast trying to make parts for consumers or friends, then you should consider like safety factors and things like that. Um, in this day and age, there are like with Fusion 360 and other pieces of software, there's simulation that's built in mm. and it's very, very user friendly and it's getting more and more friendly. So I think that if you're designing a pedal for or like a, a pedal arm for a bicycle and you need to sustain a certain load, you could come into Fusion, draw up the part. You could go look at YouTube, how to simulate it, come up with the loads that will be, you know, applied to it simulated, validated the safety of it, and then you could come up probably to 85% of an ideal part yourself without having a formal background. But I think it's just doing the due diligence, understanding what goes into that, right? Obviously just don't go creating something and throwing it out there and say, oh, it's ready to go. Do some homework, but I think that homework is very much within reach with YouTube and a lot of other uh, like-minded people who are creating the content out there to educate everybody on how to make things, you know? So there's plenty of information out there. I've used it. I lean on it all the time. There's, it's just insane how the support system, but yeah, for any enthusiast, start out, start doodling, um, drawing, and then use the resources available to help you find a way to validate. I mean, I think the, the term you used before as well, safety factor is, is really important. You know, we're, the people watching this video are, are not going to be jumping into designing parts for an F1 car where you know, the, the weight is the, the absolute driving factor. So what I'm getting at here is we can build the part a little bit larger, a little bit stronger than ultimately needed. Yes, there's going to be a slight weight deficit there, but it gives us that safety factor. So you know, maybe it, it can withstand two times the, the forces that we're expecting to be there. It gives you a pretty good safety margin in case you know, something that you factored in wasn't quite on point? Yeah, correct. I mean, overbuilding is never a bad thing. <laughs> I mean, in this year, any fun. Yeah, I mean, uh, like, uh, the the Pegasus is overbuilt, you know? That was, uh, to your point, it was a uh, an exercise, and, you know, we could spend on some components and really take the weight out down to the ideal gram required to achieve the function, but instead we just, all right, cool, we're, we're, we're good. There's at least three times safety factor built into us. Let's go send it to the machine shop because we need it on the car tomorrow. And so that's a very easy, quick way to get parts, you know, and then, and then safely as well. So if we run them up the Bikes Peak Mountain, we, you can run them, you know, you can make parts for yourself at home. All right, I'm interested on your take on what's coming up in the future. I mean, we've seen this this area of the industry develop quite quickly over the last decade. I mean, it's definitely not new, but we, we have seen it develop, particularly in the accessibility to these these technologies. You know, get, give us your, your crystal ball gazing. What's the next sort of five to 10 years look like? Very exciting. I don't know. Um, the, the, there's so much changing. Um, there's so much, you know, I think that our creation is going to be heavily or our, what we output as people is going to be heavily augmented by technology um, that we're going to get, there's going to be a closer relationship between computer generated concepts and, and our creativity. So whether that's going to enable more creativity on our part, you know, or not, but I think it's certainly going to enable us to create more. It's going to enable more people to create more. So just as, you know, Fusion 360 is accessible to enthusiasts, uh, I just hope that it becomes more accessible so that there are people that can be coming out of the woodwork who have ideas, who haven't had the chance to realize them. But even from like a motorsport perspective, I mean, there's so many people are trying things and it's like, you know, maybe somebody creates some concept in their garage and go racing and do really well. And that could be a start of something in itself, you know, and that's just all from being enabled to access the tools. And then you will see that with more machining. So th hopefully there's a site consent for machine cut send kind of thing, right? Or print cut send kind of thing, you know, more of those are going to be coming around. So parts are going to be at your fingertips. Uh, and I think much more cheaper, much quicker and much easier to create, um, you know, with that's going to come automation and all this other stuff. So I think that the future of motorsport, future of car building is going to be heavily augmented by technology and enabled. I think that we're going to see cooler things. Um, and, you know, you go to SEMA, you see all these concepts that you would, would be OEM grade stuff five, ten years ago. Now these are SEMA cars. Like, holy, that's, it's pretty impressive to see now even.
Yeah, I, I think I 100% agree that you know, we might not be able to say exactly what the future holds, but suffice to say it's going to only become cheaper and easier to access these technologies. And with that, as you mentioned, the quality of our builds can can be uh, accelerated so dramatically. So I think the, the key takeaway for people watching here is don't be afraid of the technology. It's it's not as daunting or as hard to, to get your head around as, as you may think and uh, sort of embrace it because it's going to really pay dividends in the future. But Dimitri, if people want to find out more about you and BBI Autosport, where are they best to go to? I think our website or Instagram at BBI Autosport or BBI Autosport.com is a good starting point. And then just email us, reach out, DM us and happy to answer any questions. Great. Thanks for your time there, Dimitri. Thank you. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.